As the latest game console generation starts to establish itself as the new standard, and the old one settles down to rest, the mind easily drifts towards retrospection. PlayStation 5 brings a fuller perspective on PlayStation 4, and that applies doubly for the PlayStation 3, which has now moved even further away from contemporary relevance. When it's no longer in recent memory and immediately compared to what's hip and current, your view may grow fonder, as something that was previously just old and dated now comes with an added charm and allure. There might even be some nostalgia towards it. For one reason or another, perhaps it'd be more fun to go back and play around with this aging relic than spend all that hard-earned cash on the latest PlayStation 5 blockbuster, Ratchet & Trance. So, you do so, dust off the old console, find interesting games for pocket change on the second-hand market, and have a blast. Perhaps you never found the time to play Puppeteer, feel like revisiting Metal Gear Solid 4, or want to discover firsthand how horrible PlayStation All-Stars is, now that you can just get it for like two bucks. For many, the real journey of fully exploring the game library of the PlayStation 3 starts now that it's affordable, has a fairly set canon of classic games that ultimately defined it, and full hindsight context. But perhaps such worldly things are actually luxuries, granted to none other than the people who had the benefit of being present when the console was current. You see, in late March 2021, Sony suddenly announced that they would completely discontinue the PlayStation Network digital stores for the PlayStation 3 as well as its brethren, PlayStation Portable and Vita. And the clock was ticking as people were only given three months to process the news, assess the irreparable damage this would cause, research what games they absolutely needed to get on super short notice, and also figure out how the hell they would afford to just cough up all that money. With the flip of a switch, Sony would destroy a large part of their own history. Games like Trash Panic, Echo Chrome, Lingering Shadows, Lokoroko Kokoreko, Detuned and Rain would become, if not completely undone, at least a lot less accessible. In addition, these news brought to light previously undiscovered tragedies, like how Nobby Nobby Boy, which was arguably one of the biggest flagship exclusives for the service, had already been unceremoniously removed a couple years prior. Through one fatal decision, the PlayStation 3 went from a fun old curiosity to an endangered species. Not to speak of its surrounding casualties, hardware like the PESPCO would become tragically worthless and be immortalized as a cautionary tale of how video game publishers will encourage us that digital is the future. As long as it befits them. Which is 12 years to be precise. Echoing through the public discourse in the weeks that followed was a harrowing quote from June 2017 by Sony's head of global sales, Jim Ryan, about the prospects of game longevity and the appeal of classic titles. When we've dabbled with backwards compatibility, I can say it is one of those features that is much requested but not actually used much. That, and I was at a Gran Turismo event recently where they had PlayStation 1, 2, 3, and 4 games, and the PS1 and PS2 games, they looked ancient. Like, why would anybody play these? While not directly connected to the decision of pulling support for their old network services, it nonetheless gave insightful context to what the motivations behind the decision might ultimately have been. It's fair to assume that Sony never intended to make up for this loss in any particular way, souring the discourse further as the narrative now firmly orbited around Sony not just streamlining their online maintenance, but doing so because they perceived said service to be completely worthless. Ultimately, this was just a really bad idea. Everyone hated it, and evidently Sony got the message. Less than a month later, they completely backed down, reaffirming that the PlayStation Network digital stores would remain open for their aging consoles. But in many ways, the damage was already done. This didn't feel as much as the crowd persuading the powers that be into changing their minds. It read more like a postponing of the inevitable. 
It put into perspective how fleeting digital media is, how definitive control of distribution, being in the hands of the publisher, would endanger these games to be erased once they stop turning a profit, and a much important cultural history that could just be gone from one day to the next. grasp the whole scenario around the PlayStation 3 and its digital distribution, it's important to contextualize the console with its contemporaries. Sony's PlayStation 3 together with Microsoft's Xbox 360 and Nintendo's Wii are all part of what is regrettably referred to as the seventh console generation. These were partly defined by a graphical leap in fidelity through the rise of the HD format, a focus on intuitive control methods with a broadening of target demographics, and how games could use online services that were now increasingly integrated with the systems. These were the years that not only gave us patches and DLC, but also shifted the industry towards those being an inevitability rather than a potential possibility. The days of popping a disc into the device and having a go were over. Now consoles had elaborate operating systems, where playing games was just one of many options. The most obvious prospect of having built-in network services for a game console, apart from playing with other people online, is for distribution of games to be made digitally. In a time where physical media is rapidly losing its influence, it's perhaps not immediately apparent how the earliest forms of digital-only games were distinctly new and unique in their production, design and publishing. The previous software generation was intrinsically chained to physical media, which meant that any production needed to be profitable enough to cover manufacturing, and that funding for this whole process in addition to the development absolutely required a publisher to back the project. Now, publishers are pretty harsh gatekeepers for your radical game ideas when said game also need to be appealing enough for people to buy it at full retail price. So whatever games got made usually had some kind of extended scope, in either content or production values. Take a game like Alien Hominid on the original Xbox. In many regards, this was a landmark occasion in the history of the medium, as it marked one of the first firm occasions of a straight-up indie title being released on a mainline console simply because some wild company called Sue Digital Publishing decided to give it an honest chance. At the time, the existence of the game in itself was novelty enough, which is evident in that no one actually bought it. Contrast this with the developer's second game, Castle Crashers, from three years later, which was a highly regarded financial success, and the difference is striking. What sets these games apart is not the design or presentation, but it's rather the means of distribution that really made one more market viable than the other. Digital download enabled publishers to take higher risks on smaller game ideas that were uncompromising in their execution. Not to speak of how older titles could be re-released and sold at a vastly reduced cost. A service like Xbox Live Arcade almost single-handedly turned indie games from obscure freeware computer programs to a serious industry staple, where audiences finally started seeing them as real games. At least they humored the idea. People are like, oh, shit, I'm gonna die! <laughs> By lowering the benchmark for breaking even on a production, the video game medium in many ways liberated itself from rigid conventions and practices, in ways that are not just still felt to this day, but practically defines our contemporary cultural climate. All 7th generation consoles relied partially on digital-only games, and as such they form an important part in their full context and inhabit great relevance to video game history. 
Being able to go back to these games for appreciation, analysis and re-evaluation is not just a given, it should arguably be seen as intent cultural erasure to negate this possibility for future generations. In that sense, you'd be justified in seeing this one generation of digital content as the most important one so far for historical preservation simply through it marking such a sharp turn for games as a whole. With this in mind, you can make a whole lot of judgments, based on how every console manufacturer treated the longevity of this formative generation. Later Xbox models will allow players to log into their old profiles and access games they bought over a decade ago, sometimes with improved performance and decreased load times. Like Blinks here, he is prettier than he has ever been. It's amazing. Just look at him. Meanwhile, Nintendo straight up axed all online capabilities for the Wii a couple years back, which even at launch were ridiculously dated and limited and Nintendo hasn't exactly shown much signs of improvement in the 15 years since. It should be absolutely obvious, but let's clarify here. People really like to have their old games on Xbox, and no human being outside of Nintendo's office thought it was a good idea to close down the Wii Digital storefront. And Sony are apparently leaning on the Nintendo approach, with their backpedaling evidence for some frankly incomprehensible levels of tone deafness. Like, what did they actually expect would happen here? No really, what was their expectation? How did they think people would respond to it? Why would anyone- Okay, so it has to be said, the efforts Microsoft has made towards furthering backwards compatibility on their consoles is commendable. The library is sporadically bolstered with new old titles, but that's also the huge catch to their entire process. When Xbox One was released, it had no backwards compatibility. Instead, this was something gradually implemented afterwards. Microsoft had an infamously catastrophic stint of cockiness around that time, and in many ways, the casualty was their back catalog. These games are rapidly growing older and more arcane, making them increasingly cumbersome to convert to a newer format, with a lot of the games practically being abandonware at this point. With 2020 hindsight, the right move would have been to help and encourage developers and publishers to make their titles carry over to the new generation on day one. Or they could have just assigned Xbox One to support all 360 games by default. Oh shut up tech bros, I don't give a shit if it's super hard to do on like a technical level. Microsoft is a multi-billion dollar company, okay? If Bill Gates wants you to play Minesweeper Flags on your new Xbox, he'll just make it happen. What Microsoft is doing is good in contrast to their competitors, but in full context it reads more like damage control of an old generation that was ultimately failed by them. Meanwhile, Nintendo and Sony left their old systems out in the cold to die because a clean slate was the easiest approach. So in that regard, Microsoft gets half of a thumbs up for at least, you know, not just ignoring the problem. In fact, both Sony and Microsoft seem to have prepared themselves for the future since this whole debacle, with their PlayStation 4 and Xbox One resembling PC architecture instead of being a bunch of odd parts scrambled in a box. This means practically all previous generation games are fully playable on the new hardware. Except PT. Because Konami fucking suck. However, while the current console climate seems to be set for a bright future of centralized systems where generations stack on top of each other, there is no guarantee that this will be around forever. We don't even need to imagine whether Xboxes 50 years into the future will still be able to play Blinks or what happens if Sony goes out of business. Everything, from individual games to entire services, could be snapped out of existence from one day to the other. And time has already shown us that old software can be completely discarded if deemed convenient. 
At launch, PlayStation 3 could play games from the previous two generations, but a couple years in, all PlayStation 2 support was dropped to save on costs. Likewise, PlayStation 5 can play PS4 games, but will that be true for PlayStation 6? Or PlayStation 7? Regardless of how good things look with console services today, no one knows how that will fare tomorrow. And in that context, the Wii is important in how it has set realistic expectations for the full lifetime of these systems. After a little more than 10 years, Nintendo apparently considered the Wii too ancient to uphold maintenance, and with the recent PlayStation Network fiasco in mind, that seems to be a fairly solid estimate. After about a decade and a half, console manufacturers will on average have gone through two generations, and as such, said hardware is neither sold in stores, or something even stragglers are expected to still engage with on a full level. Like, of course only a minuscule fraction of the 100 million Wii owners still bought WiiWare games in 2018. It's a huge loss for game history. But from a business perspective, it makes perfect sense why Nintendo would just yeet that shit out the window. That's just the reality of what happens when capitalism has a stranglehold on culture. But thankfully, there are alternatives. And in that light, it's ironic how we, the console that was mishandled the worst and had its service straight up destroyed, would also be the game library that is best preserved and future-proofed. All of the fleeting digital games on the service that have been undone in their original form are still floating around immortalized in the ether, ready to be played whenever, forever. You see, it turns out downloading those files onto your console hardware also meant that you could wiggle them out and copy them onto more secure and impervious formats. The Wii, Xbox 360 and yes, even PlayStation 3 have loopholes for extracting and preserving their back catalogs. And although emulation is not all there yet for the latter two, rest assured that when the time is ripe, we'll be able to actually go back and explore everything these consoles had to offer. And that's a happy reassuring conclusion, isn't it? This generation was very important to the video game medium, and it will remain available to people in the future to understand why, albeit in a less conventional but still fully functional form. So cheers all around as we rejoice the averted calamity. It seems things aren't as bad after all. Perhaps game history isn't as threatened as we first thought. Oh sweet summer child, have you seen the runtime of this video? <laughs> so the troubles plaguing seven generation consoles was basically an anxious mess that could have ended in catastrophe and to some extent probably will later down the line, but at least we averted the most central crisis by offloading the games onto external drives like some sort of Noah's Ark. However, these were early platforms for digital distribution where games still had to be downloaded and stored on your private, yucky, tangible hardware. Since then, games have become increasingly reliant on our internet connections, through concepts like DRM, heavier focus on online interactivity, or just straight up siphoning the game content to you from their servers. In theory, these are games that don't need to be structured like this. But whether it's a lack of storage capacity in Switch cartridges, or an arbitrary need to control the accessibility of the content, this problem of partly online games is an increasingly worrisome practice in today's video game climate. Customers are absolutely justified in asking what it exactly is that they are buying, and if they're being bamboozled when the perceived ownership is either dubious or straight up a trick. These concerns reached a new high when in March 2019, Google unveiled their game platform Stadia on which games were no longer downloaded or even played on an actual piece of hardware. 
Instead, all of the heavy computing was handled externally by Google themselves, where the game was relayed to the player through streaming. The benefit of this was the abolishment of cumbersome machines or long boring waiting for software downloads. Instead, you could just pay for a subscription and get started playing the hottest new games right away on whatever screen device you had handy. Critique centered a lot on the practicality of creating responsive experiences over shoddy internet connections, the consumer unfriendly pricing and questions on how long Google would even support the service, considering their track record of abandoning anything that's not an immediate success. However, for a lot of people, the most worrying prospect of Google Stadia was how access to games in this system fell completely in the hands of distributors, where a game purchase in theory was as meaningful to the individual ownership of the media as buying a movie ticket. The only claim you have is the right to temporarily borrow a game from their servers whenever you actually need to use it, and as long as it's available. For game preservation, this would basically spell certain death, as any ability to actually, you know, preserve games would be completely negated. We'd instead just be consuming at the whim of whether corporations will us to or not. And even then, how could you even know it's the original game you're playing? It's a straight up frightening and disgusting idea to imagine us soon falling into a landscape where games are commodified to the point of absurdity. But it's an absolutely real concern. A lot of our benefits as consumers have unceremoniously been taken from us in the name of convenience before. And you should absolutely be wary of how this will happen again and again and again. Now, you may be skeptical of the fear-mongering spin we're pulling here. Surely, in a system like this, wouldn't the most noteworthy and poignant game still be endlessly redistributed to us? Wouldn't historical value and public outcry straight up demand that our dearly beloved favorites would once again be made available? <laughs> no. We know this because we've already been here before, not exactly through straight up streaming, but by other systems that are similar, and especially in hindsight, effectively the same. This glory of invention, this marvelous beast of science, is called a Nintendo Satellaview. It was a Japan-exclusive peripheral that enabled a completely unique new way of game distribution for its time. Essentially, this big hunk of junk is a modem that connects to your Super Famicom like mecha docking and makes it look twice as powerful. It's every kid's dream, really. You see, in the later half of the 90s, satellite broadcasting was the established futuristic way to go for remote on-demand information distribution. Instead of bothersome landlines or 5G towers, data was blasted into space and then reflected down into your home. The quick and easy way, all around wicked stuff. The potential of using this technology as a channel for games distribution wasn't far-fetched and other similar platforms existed both concurrently and previously. The Sega channel offered downloadable games through cable television around the same time, and predating this were the services Play Cable from Mattel and GameLine from Atari, that offered this sort of distribution through cable or telephone line in the early 1980s. Absolutely amazing, bonkers, futuristic stuff, and a striking sign of the technological ambitions of the time. And this is not to undermine Satellaview as less groundbreaking or unique than it may first seem. It undoubtedly still was. It just wasn't the absolute first. So how the Satellaview worked was by extending the RAM of the Super Famicom with the interlocked main device that also connected with your satellite receiver. This allowed temporal data to be gathered from space, literally, and stored within the unit. Additionally, sound recordings were also supported by the technology, which became a staple of how many Satellaview games came to be designed and engaged with. 
There were a lot of games that had radio dramas and full voice acting to the extent where playtime had to be synchronized to specific broadcasting slots to even enable the elaborate experiences the service offered. This is constantly apparent when revisiting these old games today. Some of them will have you sit in awkward silence for extended periods of time, just waiting while others feature characters jumping up and down with their mute mouths blabbering on and on. Like shadows cast by ghosts, a large part of this experience is just imagining what was conveyed, more than actually witnessing it. At absolute worst, some games like The Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets from 1997 were so interconnected with the sound reception that they couldn't even be properly backed up, and are as such deemed lost media today. Like, let that just sink in. There's legit a full-on classic Zelda game that's just straight up gone, and Nintendo never even mused about the prospect of re-releasing it on later hardware that could accurately implement the unique audio features. Which today really is more a question of storage capability than actual satellite connectivity. That in itself should be proof enough that corporations will just not be concerned about the availability of old and obscure yet culturally important media. And in truth, with how fleeting this whole satellite distribution was, you may wonder how these games are still even playable today. Surely, this service is not still active, and supported all the way over here in Sweden for us to partake in old Nintendo goodness. No, of course not. This is just a very fancy and expensive paperweight at this point. I hope you appreciate the skewed production budget for this video. <laughs> the Satellaview service was discontinued all the way back in June 2000 and has remained so ever since. What saved most of its library from being completely lost was the life-saving convenient customer benefit implemented in the BSX boot-up cartridge. Since having to download a game every time you want to play it may be seen as a bit of a hassle, the Satellaview service could store software on little 8 megabit meta cartridges for quick and easy access. We don't actually have one of these ourselves, because… However, a select few titles like Same Game here employ these same extra slot cards to load additional content into the games partially from the Satellaview network itself, so it really was like a super early version of DLC. This little card in particular lets you play levels themed after Bomberman and Bonk in the same game, but for this video we'll just pretend that it's a fancy clean memory pack. Being able to back up Satellaview software on these is single-handedly the only reason why those games are still available to us. But the limitations of them is also the reason why so many games are lacking the sound implementation. The cartridge was simply too small to be able to store that data, so the end result are games with very compromised sound output that are luckily still playable to some extent. Sadly, the whole idea of game preservation was a bit too early when all this was going on, so there never seemed to be any real community push over in Japan to stock up on memory cards and just record everything. In truth, Satellaview Archival is to a large extent comprised of lucky finds on the second-hand market. And it's this rigid relationship between the fleeting format of temporary games and the preciousness of obtaining hard copies for eternal preservation that thematically brings us to what we'd argue was the crowning achievement of the entire Satellaview service and our prime example of why this whole scenario should be considered a travesty. You see, while Nintendo themselves like to use the format for games with full voice support or scheduled community experiences, publishers like Squaresoft saw it more as a channel for releasing supplementary content for their current blockbusters or just small form experimentation. Chrono Trigger really is a uniting factor here. The beloved time travel JRPG had a lot of bonus content relayed through Satellaview, like an extended version of the racing game, a character gallery with sprite slideshows, and even a full-fledged sound test presented the same way as the retail soundtrack CD. 
It all may seem quaint and novel today, but really, it's a display of clever solutions for how to use the service. It's questionable if anyone would actually want to buy Yet Bike Special for full price. But if you can sink a couple minutes into it through a download service for virtually free, then hey, why not? In the midst of all this was a series of short experimentations with the Satellaview service, developed by four internal teams of Squaresoft and broadcast in early 1996. We have the bizarre space racing game Dynamite Racer by Tetsu Nomura, with music by Nobuo Uematsu, the virtual relationship board game Koiwa Baransu, and the dogfighting RPG Treasure Conflicts. All games that truly deserve more attention and redistribution. But what we want to focus on is the fourth in this quartet, a game bursting in ambition and narrative scope but painfully shame-bound by its format to the extent where it's often overlooked through its obscurity or perceived as redundant by its fully realized successor. It's time to talk about how Chrono Trigger was fully benefited by the Satellaview through its fourth and final tie-in software, Radical Dreamers. Which is coincidentally the best game ever made. Just imagine for a second you're 12 years old, you've just played Chrono Trigger, and it absolutely blows your mind. It's immediately your favorite game of all time, and you can't get enough of it. Then you find out there's a sequel called Radical Dreamers, and you're like, of course I'm gonna play that! Are you kidding? This is gonna own or Ponsers. Or whatever the lingo was in 2004. So you crank that bad boy down from Emo Reactor, boot up Sea SNES with the falling snow background, and jump straight in with breathless anticipation. Only to discover that it's just a bunch of boring ass text that goes on forever and nothing happens. The game just never starts. You don't even get to control the characters. Where are my buddies Frog and Robo? Who the fuck is Serg? In shattered disappointment, you turn the game off and never think about it again for 17 years. It drifts off into the back of your mind like a broken promise, forever branded by the persistent sting of betrayal. Then you come back as an adult and realize this game is actually amazing and your baby brain just couldn't get around the concept of <laughs> reading. It's the video game equivalent of opening a book and going, no screw that, no pictures! And in that light, well, yeah, I guess a 12-year-old looking for a snappy and cool Dragon Ball adjacent JRPG will be severely let down by a subdued and mysterious text adventure. Though that's probably also why it might resonate more with us today as adults. Radical Dreamers is presented as your grandfather Serg's old journal of his adventuring days together with his budding polycule Kid and McGill. Everything being a book is a clever little explanation for the format. Predominantly, the benefits of long-form text with sparse visuals is felt in the length. But most importantly, the intimate perspective and personal emphasis on the narrative. At surface level, this is a heist story about a group of thieves infiltrating a mansion to steal the precious frozen flame. However, the desires and emotions of the cast ends up both complicating the situation, but also adding a poetic quality to it. The brash young thief kid consistently straddles the line between wanting to obtain the frozen flame or exacting revenge on its owner, Lord Lynx. The enigmatic McGill is coldly persistent on the importance of the frozen flame, but slowly opens up when faced with the exposed cruelty of Lynx. While Serg, the narrator, acts as a fish out of water, trying to prove himself as brave and competent to the gang in a spiraling situation that is beyond his grasp or control. 
The interplay between these colourful characters is the entertaining core of the game. It's a very human story that is bolstered by the fact that no one actually seems to agree on what the Frozen Flame even is for, or why it's important. It may be a MacGuffin, a granter of wishes, but mostly it reflects desires. Power, closure, redemption, love. A brief spark captured in eternity. Although they may not all be after it, its meaning pervades the entire game. It's what drives everyone to push on through the darkness. Radical Dreamers is a beautiful little gem with a troubled context. It had a rushed development of only three months, the pre-rendered graphics had extensive cuts and ended up being crunched and compressed to even fit the file size specifications, and the diverging side scenarios were so rushed that different writers had to fill in for each other. From what director Masato Kato has told about the process, it reads like this passion project was practically ripped from his hands mid-sentence by Squaresoft. Eventually, he got another chance to heavily rework the base story into the more familiar 1999 PlayStation game, Chrono Cross, which was realized as a more standard JRPG with its ties to Chrono Trigger strengthened. In this light, it's understandable why Kato felt more content with Cross. Radical Dreamers was the rough prototype that conveniently got discarded through a dubious satellite service and promptly forgotten. Although, the fans didn't forget. They wanted that game to be as readily available as anything else, but Kato seemingly refused. Two weeks before the release of Chrono Cross, a port of Chrono Trigger was released for the PlayStation. Supposedly, there had actually been plans to include Radical Dreamers on the disc as a bonus, but that never came to be. In the year 2000, shortly after the release of Chrono Cross, Kato said the following. The porting development team wanted to put all of Radical Dreamers into the Chrono Trigger PlayStation port, but was told to leave it as it was. I also rejected it. It was made four years about, and when I read the script now, I'm easily embarrassed. I think there's no reason you need to understand Radical Dreamers to enjoy Chrono Cross. A decade later, when Chrono Trigger was ported to the Nintendo DS, Kato was once again asked about Radical Dreamers, and if there had been any plans to include it in the release. I don't think there was much demand to have Radical Dreamers included. If we did include it, that would mean parts of Chrono Trigger's story would head into a different direction. As for Radical Dreamers, I have talked about the possibility of reworking it into some different form, but at present, I don't know what will happen. Personally, I have lots of doubts about re-releasing it as is. So, I've also been discussing how to revise it after all this time. It wasn't until 2015 that his feelings towards the game seemed to have healed enough for him to be okay with just dropping it as it once was, stating that, by now, he has progressed so far that it's emotionally detached from him. While there seems to have been additional corporate decisions at play way back in 1999, possibly due to the need to translate and localize the entire game for Western release, it's evident that Masato Kato slowly warmed up to Radical Dreamers over the years, eventually getting to the point where he'd actively encouraged a non-compromised re-release. But those initial sour feelings towards the project were arguably instrumental in prohibiting its resurgence, not only once, but twice. Kato may approve of Radical Dreamers today, but that ship has undoubtedly sailed by now. The best opportunities were wasted, and who knows when the next one will come, if ever. There was a slim chance that this game could have become a slightly bigger cult classic than it already is, but thankfully the Satellaview service didn't end up spelling complete demise for it. Radical Dreamers was one of the games that had no extra sound support, and as such a backup copy contains the whole thing as it was presented in 1996. Someone in the right place at the right time swooped in and caught that flash in the pan like lightning in a bottle. 
the flame that was radical dreamers had been figuratively frozen for future generations to experience. In fact, likely thanks to the game's connections to Chrono Trigger, which only really become relevant in the final act, there seems to have been extra attention aimed towards it from the very start. It's universally accepted as part of the franchise, and this, together with the heavy reliance on text, made it a highly elusive and desired game for fans to experience. But despite its important standing, Radical Dreamers was virtually unplayable for non-Japanese audiences even if it was technically preserved. Thankfully though, the absolute hero Demiforce decided to just straight up translate, adapt, refine and patch the entire thing way back in 2003, with the motivation of, eh, whatever. Yeah, I know, I should have been busy making money or living life up or getting laid or something. But somebody had to translate this game and nobody was really stepping up to the plate so I figured what the hell. Absolute king shit. For all intents and purposes, Radical Dreamers was supposed to be a Japan-exclusive throwaway, as tangible as air, with an embarrassed creator trying to cover it up as lesser. But thanks to specific circumstances and dedicated people, it was not only preserved, but made available for us to play and understand a quarter century later. For the originally intended audience, Radical Dreamers is probably just a faint memory. And that's the scary prospect of streaming games. Media that's culturally significant, just interesting or heck, neither, can simply disappear through the sands of time. Digital distribution is truly intangible, and Satellaview's entire legacy is preserved thanks to its technology still being reliant on physical media to some extent. Contemporary cartridge-based games are still around and kicking today, because of course they are. Ever since the dawn of digital-only games, people have warned of how that media is out of our control. It has no secure container present in this world that signifies it as its own firm thing. A digital release is fleeting, but physical is forever. Yeah! About that! A lot of the immediate issues and horrors about digital distribution are ones that are commonly seen as non-existent with physical media. The reliance on active services and publishers are irrelevant if all copies of the game are out there in the world, beyond the reach of their filthy pig hands. Hardware issues are a lot less scary when you can just play your game on any system, as opposed to the one console you've downloaded all your software to. All it takes for your old WiiWare library to be gone is a bricked system, but your Wii discs are good to go anywhere. At the end of the day, buying a game on a digital storefront is a gamble, which also negates a lot of the customer benefits you'd have otherwise. Apart from Steam, most of them don't even allow refunds, which sounds like it should be illegal. And let's be real, it probably is. In contrast, a physical copy is yours to own and do whatever you want with it. Keep it forever, lend it to a friend or sell it when you're finished with it. You have as much claim to it as your socks. And in that light, digital does seem pretty silly. The only real benefit seems to be the 24-7 ease of access to purchases and pleasure of not having to get off your ass and change discs. Did we really get so slothful that we forfeited our customer rights because changing cartridges is too much of a bother? Really? Like, what do you mean digital is easier to carry around? You can easily fit 30 Switch cards in your goddamn pocket. Stop it. When placed side by side, it's easy to get the impression that physical is so superior that it borders on being ridiculous. You may even form a slight aversion to digital media in general, like you actively avoid it as much as possible, if there are options. This isn't even targeted at anyone else. Given the choice, 100% of the time we'd go with a store-bought copy rather than a download. This is not to say we don't play digital games, because we do, and probably own more in that format thanks to Steam sales, Humble Bundles, Epic Store giveaways and Itch.io charity initiatives. 
We're just saying there's a healthy balance of wanting to resell your copy of Sonic Forces and deciding that a discounted tearaway download is more worth it than scrambling off to the store to pay more for it. You can have both, you know. You don't need to pick a side here. It is, however, undoubtable that physical games are seen as more valuable and are more sought after because of the premium you get with the purchase. Just ask the retro game market where old games fetch for way more than their modern port counterparts. There is a high demand and a dwindling supply, making prices skyrocket further and further. Of course, there isn't much money for corporations to be made in this market, but the way we continuously raise the threshold for what an acceptable video game price is has absolutely set a precedent. Our desire to pay more for games led publishers to start selling everything as limited deluxe editions, often with contents that standard issues once would provide for no extra charge. Like manuals. The new frontier for this practice of making old norms an exclusivity is the physical game as it is, as in just a copy in itself. During the last few years, companies like Limited Run Games have gained in traction, creating a small sub-industry within the video game scene that, while relatively small at this point, might be an indication for the future of physical media. By selling reservations, these companies gauge interest in niche titles and manufacture a small production line of physical copies. This is a booming industry for high-profile indie games to be immortalized as non-digital. This is where they are given physical form to ascend into becoming, I don't know, real games or something? The question we should immediately ask ourselves here is why this is done? What's the purpose with these games? Who are they for? Remember, these are editions of games that have usually been out long enough to already gain an audience. There is little convenience in pre-ordering the most expensive version of a game that will take months to be produced and shipped. Obviously, this isn't for casual audiences, but rather for fans and collectors. It's a production line for people who value physical media to an almost excessive degree, where they'll support the game factory itself in order to obtain their copies. They practically will products into existence in a marketplace where they wouldn't be produced otherwise. Although, no matter how fun or cool it is to buy your favorite games a second time around to get them in a luxurious deluxe edition, it's important to take a step back and question if we're actually being exploited here. If the corporate practices that made us value physical over digital are now being turned against us to cash in on that perceived value. Let's go back to the thought of streamed games. The potential future where everything is controlled by publishers and ownership is a thing of the past. A common answer to this idea is firm refusal. Oh, when that day comes, I'll just drop out of modern gaming altogether. Or, well, I've got such a huge backlog that I'll be set for life anyway. It's the assumption that companies would be okay to just let their audiences go, and that no one would answer that demand. Like, first off, the streaming companies will go brutal on millennial nostalgia to get us on board that ship. It will be relentless. Think of that impossible pipe dream game you've wanted them to make for years. Yep, they'll make it. The Pokemon MMORPG, Sonic Adventure 3, Final Fantasy VI Remake, Silent Hills, Half-Life 3, Mega Man Universe, Zelda Timeline Payoff, Mother 4, Chrono Break, Metroid Dread, oh wait. Secondly, if the value of physical, or at that point even downloads, are perceived as so important, they'll absolutely accommodate that desire. They'll find the right paths and solutions to sell something we can touch with our grubby little jam-stained hands. You know, if that's what it takes, if that's where the money is. All this is to say that physical media has an inherent cultural problem of being seen as the most valuable form a game can have, which results in a costly second-hand market and costly corporate bullshit, to the extent where our appreciation of the physical format is so singular that we're easily tricked into prioritizing it without question. 
Companies like Super Rare Games and Devolver Digital have decided to abuse this by just going full clown and skip the entire stage where these games are also available in a digital form. I mean, who even needs that alternative? Physical exclusivity, baby! Because apparently we'll just eat shit as long as it's served in a plastic case. When talking about physical media's benefits over digital, with the context of services that may eventually shut down and licenses that can be revoked at a moment's notice, perhaps the most common prevailing thought is preservation. It's inevitable. This isn't just about having a neat copy of your favorite games. It's about securing their future when they are no longer seen as financially viable by corporations. Putting a digital-only game on a disc or a cartridge is practically a rescue mission, so we can rest assured that they are no longer at risk of suddenly disappearing. Limited run games, strictly limited games, special reserve games, and first press games all mention the idea of preservation and unreliable digital storefronts in their mission statements. And in context of Wii being dead and PlayStation 3 on the shopping block, they're probably justified. Well, kinda. Games preservation is a nice and optimistic sentiment. The business of selling physical copies of current niche games is justification of their legitimacy. Of course they deserve salvation. Our very slim definition of salvation. That's for sale. In a limited amount. Honestly now, does you can trust our releases to stay limited really sound like preservation to you? We know the way these companies operate is through pre-production orders, which drastically affects quantity. But if you've ever wondered why they never do second runs of these games no matter how popular they are, this is why. Exclusivity. It's to incentivize commerce. You can buy this now, and then never again. This is your only chance to have this game forever. Preservation under this model is nothing more than a nice thought. They're not actually selling preservation, or even providing it. They're rather selling a very superficial idea of it. Of course, these games have a potential of outlasting their digital counterparts in this format, given our frame of reference. But by how much? We like the idea of owning games, keep them as our own little library of Alexandria for future generations to marvel at, or burn down. From a very narrow personal scope of preservation, this is sound. This copy will last you a good while and, no matter what happens to their digitally distributed counterparts, it's persistent on this one separate storage medium. But then what? Discs and carts aren't eternal, you know. Everything will one day turn to dust. Or, to be less dramatic about it, most of these stored applications will get corrupted. Someday. But we know that. It's the awkward inevitability of the universe. We just really don't like to think about it. But there's still a lot of time to work within. Or is there? In early May 2021, word on the street had it that European copies of the 3DS games Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are starting to malfunction. Mind you, this wasn't a universal thing. Plenty of people reported their copies as completely fine, with the faulty ones having dropped off as early as two years prior. The date is more when this was discovered and widely reported on, rather than a sudden cataclysmic event. But regardless, this was still alarmingly soon for a game not even six and a half years old. It really put the lifetime of these physical cards in perspective, where what we had earlier assumed to be everlasting actually had a shockingly short expectancy rate. So what gives? Are all 3DS games just screwed, doomed to become worthless plastic in the next few years? Well, not exactly. While this event is of course a good reason to be wary of the sustainability of the format, it's an outlier for the time being. The regional aspect is a dead giveaway of this being a mistake in production, rather than an indicator for how long a 3DS game lasts on average. Nevertheless, it's hard to look at your 3DS games the same way again, after knowing this. You might question if they all still work, and if they do, for how long? 
the sinking realization that this is a flimsy, unreliable format, sold with an invisible best buy date. What we want to know when learning about the ever approaching demise of physical media is what the life expectancy of these formats are. How long do we have left before games start dying off en masse? The answer to this, as you might expect, is unclear. One of the main reasons is that, for the moment, this is all mostly in theory. We haven't seen it happen yet in large quantities. Perhaps when everything has died in the far distant future, we will have a perfect measurement in how long things truly lasted. As for now, all we have are rough guesses. A quick internet search will probably give you an answer that sounds concrete and informed. But when you start cross-referencing these sources, you realize they vastly contradict each other. Take a format like CDs. They have been around for years and are still conventionally sold to this day. It feels like we should have a good impression of how long this format lasts. But that's just not the case. Going by the extremes of lower and higher estimates for compact discs, we seriously end up with a comically large ballpark of 2 years to 500 years. So if you just want to go by a hard number, well, is any time in the next half millennia useful enough for you? You might ask, what is up with that shit? What gives? How can this fluctuate so much? Why is it all so imprecise? Well because it's just not that simple. In a 2014 NPR article on the life expectancy of CDs, preservationist Michelle Yuket phrased it all very succinctly. Everyone always wants to know the answer to the same question. How long do CDs last? What's the average age? But there is no average, because there is no average disc. A format like CDs has a global production and distribution. They are made in different configurations with different materials by different factories all over the world. A specific year for a specific CD factory could be all dead and gone by now, while something of equal or older age could be completely fine. And that's not even factoring into how the discs are handled or stored. A rarely used disc will probably last longer from less exposure to potential danger. So if you don't play your games, that's probably actually better for them. Basically, the ideal way to treat games for preservation is more akin to a bunker on Svalbard than your house. A key factor to this is temperature. Physical media like CDs hate heat, and they especially hate fluctuating heat which is common in places like regular homes. If you've got a box of games in an attic somewhere, get those poor suckers out of there ASAP. If your game collection is exposed to sunlight at any point in the day, turn down the blinds. If you live in a place with seasons, relocate to the South Pole. Room temperature will not do, so if you've got a bunch of games that you want to ensure will last you as long as possible, you should start storing them in your fridge or something. But who in the right mind would do that? As things stand, unless you're safekeeping your games in ideal circumstances, it's not unreasonable to expect them to drop off within the next decade or two, especially the stuff that is already pretty old by now. Speaking of, it's really hot in here. I need a drink. Give me a second. Under these admittedly grim conditions, it's easy to lose purpose with physical media. What's the point of having a tangible copy if it's just gonna cease to be one day? Well, apart from also still being able to play most of these games today, there has to be something more to them. Surely, there has to be. The present day Satellaview is just a hunk of plastic and metal. Yet, it's still worth something. A cartridge is still worth something, a complete copy with a manual even more so, and extra if it's in great condition. 
Popular games are expensive, rare games as well. There is absolutely a difference between collecting old games and just playing them. They likely attract different audiences, but it's an interesting relationship to have with dying media. The fact that prices for games fluctuate so much is proof that they are worth something. Even if two discs contain the same data, it's their conditions that dictate the pricing. It would seem that somewhere here is where we find the true value of physical games. Outside of them, it's about paratext and authenticity, to partake in the complete package, to see the full presentation and know that this is the real deal. Playing an old copy on a real console is functionally the same as modern ports, but it feels more legit. In context of cultural heritage and history, this form of emotional authenticity can be referred to as genius Loki, the pervading presence of the subject, visiting the Parthenon in Athens, seeing the bold strokes of a Picasso, or yes, even owning a Satellaview unit all makes you feel closer to history in some way. Filling that same space as ancient civilizations, standing in the footsteps of giants, or touching something that was part of a very small chapter in video game history. The Satellaview is a good example for the problems with this authenticity in practice. Yes, it's the actual hardware, but since the service is down, it's no longer used like it would have been at the time. All we can do with it now is to have it as decoration or prop in a YouTube video, which is not really what it was made for. So is this piece of hardware more authentic than copies of the games it could play? That's up for you to decide. In fact, you clearly don't need to pick one over the other, since we've used both in this video. It should be noted that this question of authenticity will likely become more relevant once old games start malfunctioning in larger numbers. Early on you may see a drastic change in value, where games that have stopped working are priced cheaper than the ones that do work. But once that balance shifts, it'll likely just be an accepted fact that what you're really buying here is the paratext and not the game in itself. This brings us back to companies like Limited Run Games, with their production of special physical copies for hardcore fans and collectors. Notice how they commonly present the games with things like sales taglines and screenshots on the back, like if it was actually sold on location to a customer who'd learn about the game from this very information. That's what the design is initially for, but these editions instead use it as an aesthetic. They fabricate a new paratext to create an impression of something more traditionally familiar, forming a sort of false narrative around their distribution. From a perspective of authenticity, this is absolutely fascinating, because it's hard to figure out whether it's an intentional subversion or a subconscious adherence to norms. What we can say for certain is that this is evidently a valued part of physical games, that their presentation should be shaped like that of products, to be perceived as truly authentic. Obviously, we don't exactly propose that fans of these things literally want games to be nothing more than commerce. A more sensible conclusion is that this is how physical games have always been presented, and as such, that's what informs their design for better or worse. It does primarily give good context to what we see as authentic with physical copies, and what sort of forms such media is expected to take. Which is absolutely valuable for explaining something like this. This is a brand new copy of the cult classic text adventure Radical Dreamers, as made famous by YouTube channel Transparency. It was only distributed on the obscure Satellaview peripheral, and has since remained an exclusive game for the now defunct service. Yet here it is, in the flesh, localized and playable on our PAL unit. In the olden days we'd call this a bootleg copy, but I guess once people started to find real application for them, they were rebranded as repro cards, or more formally, reproduction cartridges. So why does this exist? What's the use? 
well, it's perhaps the logical conclusion of the insistence of physical media as superior, where you no longer commission official outlets to make those games for you, but rather decide that any method is fair game, as long as you can have that media on a physical cart to be played on a proper Super Nintendo. In this case, authenticity is the original Super Nintendo hardware and its function. But Radical Dreamers is literally unplayable in this way normally, at least the English translation. The fabricated paratext is as manufactured as the means of playing it, with its misspelled yore, the description ripped from Wikipedia, and screenshots from the first five minutes of the game. It's an utterly silly solution to this whole problem of the limitations of physical media. There is no history here, it's an empty measure that cannot mitigate what it's trying to solve. Because it's using the very same methods that created that problem. Taking a copy of a digitally distributed Super Nintendo game and loading it on a new cart, looping around to reach the same conclusion, where it will once again be doomed to perish. It's a fancy package, a neat imaginary what if, a fun novelty, a radical dream. But it's a distraction. Around halfway through Radical Dreamers, there is a sequence where the gang breaks into a treasure chamber filled with gold and riches. At the far end sits the frozen flame, the elusive goal finally within their reach, placed within its natural habitat as the most valuable possession in the world. But when inspected further, the gem shatters. It's a decoy, a trap to distract potential thieves who superficially mistake the true value of the artifact. This is clearly not where it belongs. It's more important than that. McGill reaffirms this by stating that Lynx would never have left a real flame in a place like this. By now, it should be clear that video games are insecure little bastards that continuously find new and obnoxious ways to die. The past is set to perish, the present plagued by leap of faith services, and the future a potential dystopian hellscape. Is this it? Is game history fated to be strictly controlled by capitalism selling and reselling the accepted canon to us again and again? Is there no salvation to be found? Can we not save videos game? Well, of course we can. The solution is painfully simple. It's one you've probably already thought about several times during the runtime of this way too long video. In fact, it's so prevalent that despite our best efforts, we couldn't avoid indirectly mentioning it every previous chapter. Come on, you know how all these issues are actually nothing but silly, trivial bullshit. How this is the universal solution to a prosperous future that is forever eternal. Yet, it's mired in needless controversy, because the effectiveness of it is so unavoidable that corporations want to paint it as immoral in any way possible. Hypocrites they are, I say, as they further mutilate their own legacy ceaselessly until the end of time. Take this copy of Echo the Dolphin on Mega CD, for example. Cool game, an old favorite, unique from the original Mega Drive version with new music, additional levels, and some kind of FMV documentary about dolphins. Dolphins breathe air, though they live in the sea. When you buy Echo today, this is not the version you get. So it's somewhat of a rare exclusivity. This one should be about 30 years old by now, basically at high risk of being gone forever. And that doesn't even account for the fragility of a mega CD unit. If your first name is not The Angry, you probably don't even own one of those. Luckily though, there are better and more readily available alternatives. You might not know this, but you can actually pop this whopper into your computer's disk drive and play it right there through an emulator. Sadly, 
Our middle-aged dolphin game is probably too old to even be functional by now. It's just been out of the fridge for too long, you know. Actually, turns out it's amazingly still playable. Neat, let's copy that. Whew, that's Echo saved for the grandchildren. They'll even be able to flip through the manual and look at that sleek 90s aesthetic disc design. Wowee, good thing we didn't expect Sega to do that job for us. Because they never would. Of course, it's not always as simple as Echo the Dolphin. How easy it is to rip and emulate a video game will depend on a myriad of factors. But the point is that this is what needs to be done if we are to truly commit to preserving video games. To digitize media into easily managed files that can then be moved and copied across different storage mediums and devices is at this very moment by far the safest bet we have. The legality may be dubious, but the morality should be unquestionable. Because what is the alternative? We can't expect capitalist companies to preserve these games, not because they don't have the resources to do so, but simply because they are incompatible with the very concept. They are not truly interested in maintaining culture. For them, it is just commerce, and there will inevitably be some games that are not fit for that model. Sega, for example, is only interested in reselling the more popularly recognized version of Echo the Dolphin, not the obscure CD version that only weird nerds like us care about. You see, if it doesn't sell, it will be discarded. By this logic, it makes sense that they can't make every single game available to you for purchase. Or rather, they just won't, because there really is no great profit in doing so. Nintendo have even made an entire business model out of not selling classic video games to you, because they understand that they can reap even more from first letting these games become old, unavailable, and rare. As those games become more scarce and prices skyrocket on eBay, so does the perceived value of them. Why sell a few copies of Link's Awakening for a couple bucks on Virtual Console when you can remake it and sell millions of units for 60? Most people can probably see this vault strategy for what it is and realize that it's not being safeguarded for altruistic reasons. It is being kept from you and everyone who genuinely cares about the cultural significance of these literal pieces of art. In fact, companies like Nintendo have proven time and time again that they are not only uninterested in supporting preservation causes, they are an actual threat to them. And we are not even talking about the targeting of ROM sites, because we don't even need to go into that legal can of worms to make this point. I mean, come on, they have been trying to sell us the narrative that emulators are illegal, even though they've lost court battles over the issue. They have tried their very darndest to make renting or reselling your own games into a freaking felony. And boy, do they wish it were true. What we are saying is that you absolutely shouldn't put any faith in these ghoulish entities to safe keep history and culture, because that is clearly a fool's errand. So if not the copyright hogs, who does the preservation then? Well, silly, it's just regular old people like you and me. As it's always been. Emulator development, ROM dumping, mods, fan translations and patching have always been contributed by the people most passionate about the medium itself. And they do it for free. It's an inherently altruistic operation. We have these people to thank for an innumerable amount of preserved history that will remain so for all time for the simple act of sharing and caring. And they will continue to do this for the good of video games as a whole. Like it or not, this is true preservation, the most uncompromising and complete version of it. It's undeniable. If someone says they're for game preservation, but against emulation, well, they're just straight up clown liars. But this is also why preservation is something that needs to be done now, actively and meticulously, to ensure that nothing is lost along the way. 
we can't do our retroactive initiative 50 years later, there will just be too much lost history by then, both when it comes to currently commercially available games, but also in tracking down and securing old development ROMs, which run the highest risk of being lost forever due to being printed on more temporary storage formats. The message here is that either we preserve video games today, or we might not even get a chance to do so tomorrow. It's these things that make game preservation, by all means necessary, an ultimately morally just cause, and the people allowing us this luxury should be lauded as downright heroes. And when all of this is hopefully public domain in a century or so, the work that was put into game preservation today will be equal to a present day version of the Library of Alexandria, and by then there will be no pretensions that this is not the case. Of course, our infatuation with legit games preservation isn't the be all end all of video game consumption and culture. It would be downright hypocritical of us to sit in a pile of physical games and say that emulation is the only way to go. In fact, it doesn't even matter what you do, we are right now living in an opportune time when we can actually decide to just play video games any way we want. You don't need to worry about making sure that your Switch games are ready to be backed up when the time arrives. Come on, those games are already dumped! Did you really think you needed the cartridges to do it? You know you can copy digital Switch games, right? You did know that when you ordered those physical copies, didn't you? This is not to downright advocate theft, we're more talking about the reassurance of what will happen in the long term. Hopefully, you'll see the difference between pirating the newest indie game and the ability to be able to go back and experience it again in 20 years, with the help of an emulator. You should of course support developers to the extent that you can. What we're thinking of right now is more so the very large picture. It is nice to think that everyone should follow the rules, just hold on to their copies of Billy the Hatcher and wait for it to become public domain before doing any significant data preservation. But that is simply too narrow-minded. This grot is not waiting for anyone, so to speak, and where big companies fail culture, someone has to step up and do the dirty work to ensure that a lot of these games have any kind of future at all. A future where you, much like us with our aging Echo the Dolphin, can pop an old game into your PC and just play it, because someone cared enough for you to be able to do so. With this, we can rest assured that we don't actually need to do anything about game preservation, neither us or you, the viewer. Mind you, this isn't meant as nihilistic apathy. There is simply just no need to make an hour-long YouTube video to incite people into saving video games, because the ones doing it are already so convinced and determined in their cause that they'll do it regardless. Heck, if we inspired you to join the cause, then that's just all for the better. But ultimately, it's your choice to make. A game like Radical Dreamers owes its indelible existence and long-standing legacy to emulators and dedicated fan translators, who allowed it to persist against all odds. They're fundamental to us even talking about the game today, and that will be the case for so many more games both past, present and future. It's a striking example of how the traces of game preservation are so undeniable it would be willful neglect to not acknowledge them. Radical Dreamers is the ultimate proof that nothing can hinder even the most fleetingly inaccessible gem from being immortalized as part of video game canon that we will always be able to enjoy that brief moment in time forever. We are all allowed a chance to obtain the frozen flame. Thank you for watching this ridiculously long thing all the way to the end. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting us on Patreon, as it helps us to make more stuff in the future. And on that note, we'd like to thank our current Patreon backers. And they are Andrew Jones, Luke Gay, Afayette, Ben Clark, Bibi the Bitch, 
Kaltafeina, Ember, Emrasa, Gage McColgan, Joel Nilsson, Klaus Morals, Matthias Graman, Miaumik64, Mosling, Nate Kiernan, Nishtvert, T.B. Skyen, Abigail Nail, Amanda Rönne Idenge, Andreas, Basklin, Billy Moran, Bloomberg Ultra, Botch Frivari, Charles Goldhaber, Chloe, Chloe Strange, Eli Berg Maas, Ephemeral Mist, Fluffquist, Frankie Teardrop, Marika, Mar B, Max Miller, Mitch Haley, Nathan Schaff, Never Haunting You, Ray Vokas Magma, Sweet Pink, Scott from Nerdsync, Silly Rookie, Skyhoppers SR, Silva Rugata, VG, Wimsim, and C33. We would also like to thank our latest Ghost Tier supporters Mark S, Tyler Likes Cookies, Sack, Terra Crafty, Jordan, Mika, Falcarianon, Paperlanti, and BAP27. Once again, thank you everyone. Uh, there will be a new audio companion coming out very soon after this, so get ready for that thing. We are planning to read out every backer name in those episodes, so if you are not being read out loud here, that's the place where you can find that stuff. Um, so we'd really like for you to listen to it and uh, have fun. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's fun times. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I'm gonna take a break. Apparently, Alicia is on break, so I guess I have to talk now. Uh, if you want to watch another video, you should press the buttons on screen. I really like the one to the left. That's the best one. I love Radical Dreamers, and I'm so glad I got to talk about it now in this video. Uh, it's the best game. I love it. Also, Surge is really funny with his clown pants.